So I want to try to leave just a moment for that afterwards, but you know how those preachers go, but just because there's so much going on in the Middle East. Um, but, uh, but Numbers chapter 16, so here we go. So Numbers chapter 16, quick, uh, quick review and update. You know, we've been going through the Pentateuch, and Genesis covers... And thousands of years, and then, but it was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all written within this 40-year time span between when God delivered them out of Egypt to when they would go into the Promised Land. And so, as we came out in Exodus, Exodus covers about a year's worth of time in those chapters. And so they'd been out of, out of Egypt for almost a year, or by the time they, we get to the end of Exodus. Leviticus covers about a month. And thus far to about chapter 14, 15, it covers about an additional year. So up until about chapter 16 or so, 15, we, we've only been out of Egypt for a couple years. Well, from 16 to 19, this, this section almost covers the next 37 years. <laughs> and then from kind of 20 on to the end, kind of covers the, it all written and happens within the 40th year. And Deuteronomy covers the last couple months, of course, as Moses reviews, and they go into the promised land. So it's just interesting that the Lord just plucks out a couple of these parts of history. And we know that they're for us today, not only because it's the Word of God and it's profitable for everybody. Unbelievers should read it. Believers should read it. It should affect our life on a macro level and on a micro level to the very smallest parts of our life. It's not just reading for history or to know about Jewish culture, but this is to speak into our life today and to speak into the church's life today. Uh, Jude brings that out um, without a doubt, and we'll probably end end there this evening. I think it's Jude 11, reaches back into this this story here and, and says this is for the church. This is relevant. This matters. God saved it out of this big, long piece of history because... It does matter. So it's a choice event, event cited by Jude specifically, and, and Paul reaches back into these things as well. God would often try to teach his people, not only with his word, but he would also try to teach them through circumstance, as he does with us as well. You know, he's always, he's always a teaching. But these guys would oftentimes rebel, uh, more often than not as God would try to instruct them or bring them to a place that should draw them near to Him. Instead, they would rebel, especially against poor old Aaron and Moses. (laughs) And they just always would come to that place. Aaron and Moses, they got themselves, you know, they would get themselves in trouble rebelling against Aaron and Moses several times. We got a couple times here in this chapter. Of course, just a couple chapters ago, we had Miriam and Aaron. They got in trouble for their rebellion. And this isn't so much that it's because you attacked a leader or something like that. It's because they would go after selfish ambition, pride, conceit. What God has given me is not enough. I'm valued based on my position or authority. And we know in the kingdom of God that God doesn't assign position and authority based on value. In fact, sometimes, according to Paul in 1 Corinthians, it may be quite the opposite. You know, a wonderful saint like Dorcas and Acts, Tabitha, who God saw fit to raise from the dead, who, you know, helped out with the poor and made quilts and all of that, and God said, man, she's, she's great. And apart from that, maybe nobody would ever know who she was because she was just serving away and as valuable as anybody there. So there's some challenges for sure. Um, we won't quite ch- can't finish chapter 16, though if we were in the old Hebrew Bible, it would be finished chapter 16. But there's two different rebellions here, and I want to I break them up. It seemed that no matter what God did or what he taught them, they were always, they just weren't spiritually minded. And in Acts chapter 7, Stephen really brings that out. In, in verses 42 and 43, he, he points out and quotes, I think it's Amos, he, 
He points back there and says, you know what? They were always going back to their idols. They were always turning back to another god. And in verse 51 of Acts 7, he said, you know, just a real seal, real stamp, real, this is who you guys are. You've always resisted the Holy Spirit. But yet, even in this, God uses the illustration of their life. He uses this rebellion to not only glorify His name, but to teach us still today, the church and the believer. And so this is left for us. And it speaks to the church, and it should speak to us personally. Verse 1 of chapter 16. Now Korah, the son of Isar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, with Dathan and Abram, the sons of Eliab, and On, the son of Peleth, sons of Reuben, took men, and they rose up before Moses with some of the children of Israel, 250 leaders of the congregation, representatives of the congregation, men of renown. They gathered together against Moses and Aaron, and they said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourself above the assembly of the Lord? So back in Exodus, there in chapter 6, around verse 7, you know, he's going to make them a kingdom of priests. He's going to make them a holy nation. And so they're looking at that and say, well, you know, aren't, isn't the ground level at the foot of the cross? Aren't we all the same? How come you're in that spot? Which is more not how come you're in that spot. It's more of how come I'm not in that spot it is really the crux and the heart of the matter. And these guys that are going to come against them, it's an interesting crew. This is no small church split, if you will. One, it's got to be a little tough because Korah, these guys, well, they're their cousins. This guy that I dare not, probably not pronounce again, I-Z-H-A-R, well, that was Amram's brother. You know, Aaron and Moses' dad. But these are cousins, Pretty close cousins, really. They're coming up and saying, you know, who do you guys think that you are? And they grab some of the tribe of Reuben. And so you got Kohath, interesting enough, as they would carry the articles, you know, the, the very precious articles like the ark and things, and where they would line up and camp around the tabernacle just happened to be right by Reuben, where some of these guys are going to come out of. Talking, probably them late nights and long days and, how come we are and we're not? They didn't get the principle that, yes, all priests are Levites, but not all Levites are priests. It was by God's choosing. And just because, yes, Reuben was the firstborn, didn't, didn't negate God's right to choose who he would have leader. So the, the rebels, the goes who would, they'd grab this 250 leaders, and, and so these are men of renown. And so you got to think that they're not just a leader of a group. They're probably influenced each one of a pretty good swath of people. So you're probably dealing with not only the 250, but they have influence over thousands. You know, I don't know what Moses is doing. I don't know what's going on. But I trust Billy Bob because he hasn't steered us wrong. And he's one of that group going up and saying, we need to make a change of regime. You know, we need to make a change. And so he grab, they grab these influential people and work up the mob. And there's something interesting about the, the mob mentality or, or the rebels who love to stir up the mob to accomplish their will is they're always, you know, hey, man, you guys' rights are infringed. Come be on our side and we'll help you get it all lined out. You know, because these guys... Uh, Dathan, man, I can, I can never get that guy out of my head. All I see is the old Charleston Heston movie. I see that Dathan running around, just kind of that Weasley guy that's trying to get him to go back to Egypt. But old Dathan and the gang, they didn't have, they didn't have the, the congregation of Israel in mind. But they'd be, you know, hey, we're going to make it right. You know, kind of like that Absalom. Oh, you know, my dad, he won't give you justice. Come on over and see me. I'll help you out. We sure get that enough today. Oh, you know, you just poor you, and if you vote for me, I'll I'll make your dreams come true. I'll make it's all gonna happen for you. 
Selfish desire is something that the Lord deals with from cover to cover. And he's going to get and dig into it a little bit here. You know, it was something that, that even got crept into one of, the, one of the most notable churches as far as uh, the New Testament is concerned in, in the church in Philippi. Selfish ambition and, and conceit had crept in there. And it began to cause division there as well. It's something that we're always got to be on the, the lookout, always on the hunt for in our life. What was Moses and Aaron's crime? They were accused of setting themselves up as leaders. Because everybody else is just as good as you guys. You know, Moses, Moses in particular, he didn't look at himself as above everybody else. He didn't even want the job. Hmm. <laughs> Every rebellion has a leader, though, and every one has followers. Korah had a great, they had, so, they had such a wonderful job. You know, one of the greatest honors you probably could have had at that time. I mean, I mean you, carried, you carried the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> that was no small, it was no small thing. You carried the holiest articles in the land. That, the, that you weren't allowed to touch once instilled. You weren't even necessarily... Re, you, nobody but the high priest could even go and see. You were responsible for the care of that. A wonderful ministry. But, just like a man once said about money, when's it enough? Just a little bit more. Just a little bit more. God's given you an amazing ministry and a great life. What do you want? Well, just a little bit more. And an audience to rebuke and come after these guys. You know, I want an audience too. Because I'm not going to go talk to Aaron and Moses by themselves. <laughs> I want to do it in front of everybody. And I want to get people renowned around. We're going to let them know. And they pretend like they represent the people. Really speaks into their character. You know, as Moses didn't want this job, he also, which doesn't seem to be a part of this group, you know, he also had 70 elders that had the same spirit that helped them minister and to judge and to rule. Along with that, you know, we even have the testimony of where the prophets started prophesying and, and Joshua was like, hey, should we, should we silence them? They're, they're speaking for God. And Moses was like, no way, let them speak. Moses wasn't trying to be a lord over these people. He was described as the meekest man on the earth. And so we're dealing with a false accusation, selfish ambition. You aren't going to get, you know, these guys, you know, they knew, we're not going to get rid of Moses and Aaron with, with us four. You know, Dathan and Abraham and Eliab and On. I almost couldn't help myself. You know, it must have been named later in life. Very active child because he was always on. I couldn't, that was a Sandy Adams when I couldn't help myself. I, was, I thought it was pretty funny. On, what a name. <laughs> Anyways, probably laugh at James too. But. <clears throat> but they knew they wouldn't get rid of Aaron and Moses with four guys, so they get these 250 with men of renown, and, and they were influencers of other people because, you know, I, I, would, I'd be, I would venture to guess that if Moses and Aaron had wanted to, that they probably had the authority to squash this where it was to rally some troops, all right, let's, let's get our camp, even though they're kind of caught off guard here, let's get our camp, you get your camp, and, and we'll duke it out, and I think the people will back us and we'll win the battle. But he doesn't do that. And even though it, it almost kind of seems that, that uh, the sons of Korah there, they're gunning for Aaron's job, and, and the Reuben, the firstborn tribe, yeah, they're wanting Moses' place that, that Moses, he just doesn't respond like that. Let's see how he responds in verse 4. So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face, and he spoke to Korah and all the company, saying, Tomorrow morning the Lord will show you who, who is his and who is holy, and will cause him to come near to him, that one whom he chooses he will cause to come near to him. Do this, take censers. Korah and all your company, and put fire in them, and put incense in them before the Lord tomorrow. 
and it shall be that the man whom the Lord chooses is the Holy One. You take too much upon yourselves, you sons of Levi. So he kind of flips that there, the same thing they stated to him, he would turn around and say to them. Then Moses said to Korah, Hear now, you sons of Levi. Is it a small thing that you to you that the God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself, to do the work of the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to serve him? Is that a small thing to you guys? That not only that the God of the universe thinks about you, but he, he hand-selected you that he puts you out as someone approved of him and that you serve him? Is that a small thing? Man, we can apply that to the smallest, every aspect and every level of our life. But he, so he, he starts out with that. Is that a small thing to you guys? And that he has brought you near to himself and you and your brethren, the sons of Levi with you, and you are seeking the priesthood also? Question mark. Therefore, you and all your company are gathered together against the Lord. And what is Aaron that you complain against him? Which I love about that is because a couple chapters before, Aaron was rebelling against Moses. And here Moses stands for him. Forgiven, restored in the ministry. Doesn't mention anything, but just stands up for him. <clears throat> and Moses sent to call Dathan and Abraham and the sons of Eliab. But they said, we will not come up. It is a small thing that you have brought us up out a land flowing with milk and honey. <laughs> to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us. Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey, nor given us inheritance of fields and vineyards. Will you put out the eyes of these men who will come up? Then Moses was very angry and said to the Lord, Do not respect their offering. I have not taken one donkey from them, nor have I hurt one of them. So Moses, in his response... I love the first response and how difficult it is, but how necessary that response is. He falls on his face and he seeks the Lord. I mean, not me, not, not where we typically land, and perhaps this is part of the reason why God has us in this, is because our first response is self-defense <laughs> by many and all means necessary. <laughs> We like to defend ourselves and our name or who we are, our position or what, you know, maybe even sometimes for good reason. And Moses does, but Moses does it through humbling himself before God. And then he begins to answer them. And he asks them some simple questions, you know. I mean, is that, is that a small thing? Is that such a small thing to you? And I really had to weigh that out because so many times in my life I, I get caught in that thinking of, of where, you know, if you know God has you and you know God is doing and puts you in this spot in your life, where sometimes we can consider it a small thing. And I think we, it'll continue to build on that that's not small. But he, he just brings that up, you know. I mean, just If you can just stop for a moment and have that David moment of who is, who is man that God is mindful of us. But not only that, he wants to do something with you. And he wants to honor you and put you out in front of the congregation and use and bless your life. Is that a small thing to you guys, sons of Korah, those who would rebel? But here's the heart of rebellion. Can't, can't hardly get through this without at least reading James. James chapter 3, verse 13 through 16. Just that great power punch of what's at the heart of all of this. The book of James, chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? 
Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in meekness and wisdom. So a good solid uh, exhortation. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above. It's all you, baby. But it's but is earthly, sensual, and then, whoa, demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. That's what's here. In the midst of this, this envy and self-seeking, every evil thing here. And it's not only their flesh, but the enemy is in the midst, stirring them, them coals up. Hold on to that thought maybe as as the enemy is there as well, that there is this demonic activity in the midst of this because I think we're going to see that in the headlines. Again, I want to leave a little bit of time for that at the end, um, just with the the different parts of the world where there's envy and self-seeking and the things that are going on, there there is just evil in the world. It's not just two countries. It's not just men and it's not just physical and sensual, but it's evil and it's demonic. And we want to be people of prayer through it all. So as Moses humbles himself in the sight of the Lord, it, it doesn't say how long, if it was five minutes or, or the rest of that night or whatever. Um, but in that, though he knew his place needed to be to fear the Lord, to humble himself before then, he didn't for a moment fear the outcome. He didn't know what all the details would be yet, and he didn't know exactly how this is going to play out, but he knew he needed to humble himself before the Lord and he didn't fear the outcome because he knew. He knew the Lord and, and why he was there. And these guys, as they come to Moses, and they're, and they're well, you want to talk about revisionist history. That's a popular phrase this day. They turned Egypt into the land of flowing, land flowing with milk and honey. And they began to say, well, you know, you're thinking, you you didn't even do a good job, Moses. You kind of just been doing a, a pretty poor job of getting us out of here. You took us out of a wonderful land, leading us, and you haven't brought us all the good stuff. Your leadership stinks. You know, and leader, leaders are held to a higher accountability, but they're certainly not held to a perfect standard. But these guys aren't bringing it because they want to better their country. It's that self-seeking. They didn't realize... And this is, I think this is what's so important, and for, for me, maybe you get a hold of it, and, and maybe you don't, but this, I think, is where it really speaks into our life. Maybe not specifically the same as Moses and Aaron, but when they wanted to usurp them, when they wanted to replace them and get into what they had, the sons of Korah and Reuben and these guys, what they didn't understand is they were messing with eternal things. I mean, when Moses was... Being led by the Lord and used by the Lord, he was not only living his life and ministering to a nation, but God was using him to to paint a picture, to tell a story, to, to point to his son. And to yank him out of that spot would to be mess with those would to would be messing with those things. The same with Aaron. As a high priest, it was a specific picture of Jesus, and you're going to go start messing with that. You're not just, you're not just, this is just a cool job, and I want that. You're messing with things that are beyond, beyond your understanding. As God sees things from beginning to end, as he has weaved the tapestry of history together, and he's given you the kids that you've had, and the life that you've had, the ministry that you have, everything in your life, it's, it's not there by happenstance or God didn't throw it together willy-nilly and if you want to just kind of shell game it around with somebody else that's all right it it all touches everything else that's why we want to stay always continually flexible to the will of the Lord we don't want to fall in the trap as these guys did and and Miriam and Aaron did back in, in in 14 where we begin to assign our value and our worth to authority and position or where we're at. And to begin to think that the ministry and the task that God has given us as small things. Even if you never did anything, and God only had one thought about you in your entire life, that's a big deal. 
he has so many and, and so much more wonderful to us than that. It, it seems like a small thing to us. But he, if, you, if you just had a moment of clarity and step back and think about who God is and what you're not, for God to even think about you and love you for a second is amazing. Let alone to care so much to intricately weave your life and to position you, to bless you, to love you and to minister to you and through you. It's just an amazing thing. And, and to envy and to covet and to not be content with where you are if you know that you know that, that God has you there. You're, you're just messing with things that God has ordained and orchestrated for his, for his own purposes. So we have to be very careful. Um, you know, God, God, I believe God absolutely loves ambitious ambition. He wants his people to want to be great for him. There's nothing wrong with the ambition, but the selfish ambition begins to touch in things that we should not. And so their pride had blinded them. And they had focused a little too much on themselves. It had blinded them. And it was going to, it was going to be it's just a real issue. Paul would warn the Ephesians in, in Acts chapter 20. You know, guys are going to come up from amongst you. They're not going to care for the flock. They're going to be wolves, and they're going to damage. And so I think that's an interesting point for Moses, you know, having compassion on the congregation, but he would have passion against the wolves. Verse 16, And Moses said to Korah, Tomorrow you and your company be present before the Lord, and they as well as Aaron. Let them take their censer and their 50 censer, <clears throat> their 250 censers, both you and Aaron, each with his censer. So every man took his censer and put fire in it, laid incense on it, and stood at the door of the tabernacle of meeting with Moses and Aaron. And Korah gathered all the congregation against them at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the congregation. Now at that moment, if they have any good sense of history, which they don't seem to, they should remember the murmuring incident back in chapter 12. The last time when the, the glory of the Lord came down like this, it didn't wind up good for those who were coming up against what the Lord had for them. <laughs> not, not a good moment. So as they could have probably put this down quickly and easy, he, he takes it to the Lord. says, all right, here's the challenge. You know, if what you've got going on is right, cool. If what I've got going on is right, let's follow that. Puts out the challenge. You know, if it's that Elijah moment. If, if Baal's God, follow him. If Jehovah's God, follow him. We're going to put it to the test. You're going to know. We're going to find out. God, God plus no one is the majority. I was just thinking about that. You know, oftentimes, you know, God, you know, anybody plus God is the majority. But I was just thinking, God, God plus no one is the majority. God plus one or more, he's teaching us a lesson. We should pay attention because <laughs> he did need us. He's using us and he's teaching and he's speaking. So God plus no one is a majority. God plus one is something to, there's something to learn. You're, and they come to Moses and say, you know, you're so spoiled, Moses. You were a prince in Egypt and now you're kind of acting like a prince over us. You just, you're just... You're just not a good leader, Moses. We need to get you out. You're just spoiled. You're silver spoon. We don't want you. Hmm. And you know, they would never know, and it's so, so often when someone will come against an individual in a circumstance like this or attack a leader or, or even just, you know, someone that who's just attacking you because you have something they want or or they're envious of your relationship or whatever. And they'll never know what happens behind the scenes. They never know. You know, with Moses, they'd never know the cost that he paid, the struggles in his family. Whether or not circumcising his kid or the, the fights or the attacks from his brother and his sister and the, everything. They would never know. But they come up to him and say, you know what, you just, we just don't like it. We don't care for your leadership. You're just a spoiled guy, Moses. 
Hmm. So he puts out the challenge. Tomorrow we're going to find out, guys. The mob, the mob always wants what the few have. Isn't that interesting? And, <laughs> you know, this, always rally up the troops, and they want what, what the few or someone else has. But they don't want the cost. They don't want Moses. They don't want to pay the price that when Moses was in the, the palace and all the riches of Egypt, and he esteemed the reproach of Christ better than all the riches of Egypt. They didn't want to do that. They didn't want to spend 40 years out shepherding. They didn't want any of the cost. They just wanted all of the glory. They didn't want the work, the shepherding, the family sacrifice. We just want what you've got, Moses. Isn't that not so the way it is? I want the work. I just want what you have. Thanks. There's always somebody willing to stir everybody up to try to get it. Verse 20. And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, Separate yourselves from among this congregation that I may consume them in a moment. And then they fell on their faces and said, O oh God, the God of the spirits of all flesh, shall one man sin and you be angry with the whole congregation? And so the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to the congregation saying, Get away from the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. Then Moses rose and went to Dathan, Abram, and the elders of Israel followed him. And he spoke to the congregation saying, Depart now from these, the tents of of these wicked men, touch nothing of theirs, lest you be consumed in all their sins. So they got away from around the tents of Korah, Dathan, and Abram. On seems to have split. And Dathan and Abram came out <coughs> and stood at the door of the tents with their wives, their sons, and their little children. And Moses said, By this you shall know that the Lord has sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of my own will. If these men die naturally like all men, or if they are visited by the common fate of all men, then the Lord has not sent me. But if the Lord creates a new thing, and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them up with all that belongs to them, and they go down alive into the pit, then you will understand that these men have rejected the Lord. And it came to pass as he finished speaking all these words that the ground split apart under them and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up with their households and all the men with Korah, with all their goods. So they and all those with them went down alive into the pit. The earth closed over them and they perished from among the assembly. Then all of Israel who were around them fled and their cry, fled at their cry, for they said, lest the earth swallows up us, up us up also. And the fire came out from the Lord and consumed the 250 men who were offering incense. Well, they should have learned a little bit from Nadab and Abihu. It wasn't all that long ago either. <laughs> you want to be the right guy offering incense. For some people it's the pits and some people get fired. They're all going to be exposed. Anyways. <laughs> oh, anyways. For Korah and the... Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give up. I got, I got several more bad jokes, but I'll save them for another time. <laughs> there are no prayer in the rebellion, but Moses prayed certainly to answer it. Foolishness and sin is one thing, but this rebellion was something that was completely different. You know, it's one thing if your kid goofs up and they're just a goofy kid and you got to straighten them out. It's another one if they're rebellious to your face. And so as these guys were rebellious and rejected God, God says, you know, keep your distance from that. You know, it's one reason why I say, hey, don't, don't be unequally yoked. Don't be tied into something, especially if somebody's rebellious to God. Don't associate, don't tie yourself to that. Because when judgment comes, you'll be affected by it. Some got caught up in their sin. Don't be yoked to it. But as it talks about their family and their kids and, and, and their stuff, everything they had went down into the pit. And <clears throat> the word there can mean grave, but it can also mean that they went directly to the, the holding place for judgment, the dwelling of the dead. Could be either. 
What I like about this is it later would say that it wasn't the entire family of Korah. And I love that God testifies. I think they, the family really learned an amazing lesson from this. Turn with me to Psalm 84. Psalm 84. A psalm by the sons of Korah. They would, re, they would later write psalms for the Lord and for worship in his house. Samuel, one of the great prophets, would be of this family. So God did destroy some of them, but he certainly didn't destroy them all. Verse 10. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. <laughs> I'm happy with packing stuff. I'm good. Lord. You want to be a doorkeeper? Praise the Lord. <laughs> Perhaps they learned a little something from this. I don't know. But that would be their descendants that would write that. These who would rebel and would be consumed, their family and their children would worship the Lord and sing songs to him. Nothing's beyond redemption or can't be used for the Lord. <laughs> Some of them were spared indeed. Only those that were necessary for judgment and justice were swallowed up. And I love that in this also that Moses and Aaron, as they would turn and pray for the congregation, the leaders that were under assault still cared for their flock. They didn't say, well, you know, help us out or get on our side. They, they instantly cared for those who were innocent. Both Titus and Romans warn us about being, staying away from divisive people, but in particular, leaders. Verse 36. <clears throat> Oops. Back over to it. Verse 36, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Tell Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, to pick up the censers out of the blaze, for they are holy, and scatter the fire some distance away, the censers of these men who sinned against their own souls. You know, the New Testament talks about you can sin against your body, you can sin against the Lord, and you can sin about, against others. But here's one to take note of, sinning against your own soul. Let them be made into hammered plates as a covering for the altar, because they presented them before the Lord, therefore they are holy. And they shall be assigned to the children of Israel. So Eleazar the priest took the bronze censers, which those who were burned up had presented. And they were hammered out as a covering on the altar to be a memorial to the children of Israel, that no outsider who is not a descendant of Aaron should come near to offer incense before the Lord, that he might not become like Korah and his companions, just as the Lord had said to him through Moses. It's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10.31. God was serious about this and he leaves them a memorial as God would oftentimes do, and I don't, would never pretend to understand all why. Oftentimes we'll start something out and remind each generation that he's serious. What a sight that would have been to have to go pick those sensors up in the middle of that. Sin's messy, and it's serious. So I want to close in Jude 11. I'll close in Jude 11. Like I said, the, the old Hebrew Bible actually ends that chapter there, so we'll come to the other part later. Jude, verse 11. As he's warning about old and new apostates, kind of gives some sum up to, about them, a woe to them. He says, Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain, not a good example, have run greedily in the air of Balaam for profit, not a good example, we'll get to that soon. And have perished in the rebellion of Korah. For the church and the believers today is the story in which we, the history which we have read today. Because we have, whether it be on a more of a micro level, we have that ability in us to do that. That a selfish ambition and conceit to take things that aren't ours, to mess with what God is doing in the lives of others, and in, in our own lives, stepping out of what He's called us to do. We're supposed to learn from this. We want to learn humility. 
We can, see, we can learn humility. We can learn forgiveness to walk in these things without being wronged, without being humiliated, without having to go through these hard things by simply reading His Word and putting it in there. That we may become wise without all the drama. So one, serve with faithfulness and contentment. Two, watch out for the Watch out for those who are innocent, even in the midst of that. These guys did. Moses and Aaron served as a great example. They cared about the congregation, even when they were under attack. Three, trust in God to do what is right. He didn't fear the outcome. And ultimately, neither should we. So really quickly, um, there's a lot going on in the Middle East, and I forgot my notes. <laughs> So as many of you guys know, there's a dozen or so rockets launched at one of our bases in Iraq. As far as my understanding, there was no casualties and the damage was actually quite minimum. Um, I was actually very thankful that our president showed um, great restraint um, because we very well, you know, wouldn't take much to be at war. Um, We both have made, made moves that could easily escalate to that point, but we're just, you know, it would be worth re- reading the beginning of Isaiah 17 this week. It would be worth rereading Ezekiel 37 and 38 this week as we see all of this unfold. Um, I believe that this war will occur prior to the rapture, but there's no guarantee of that. Um, we may be out before then. It could fizzle back down and not be anything, so we don't want to necessarily get the cart in front of the horse. But these are, these are big things, and it could escalate into a fulfillment of the prophecy in which God will turn afterwards and defend Israel and then pour His Spirit out upon Israel. Um, and so we're, we're watching some of this unfold about Syria and Damascus and the, these places, um, watching it unfold before our eyes. It was interesting... I don't take it for whatever it is. I'm not trying to interpret it. Interesting, that same day that the rockets were launched, a plane headed back to Ukraine with 178 people, I believe, crashed on the same day in Iran. Same day, two earthquakes, one 4.5, I believe 1.4.9 or 5.0, um, which was the third one of the week, all in Iran. Um, the Lord's just, you know, things are being shook up. And things are unfolding faster than most of us can interpret. They have sent um, bombers that are capable of things all the way up to nuclear capabilities off to some of our strategic bases that are about the same distance. I, forget, I apologize, I forget the name of it. Um, that has an equal distance, straight shot to North Korea or to Iran. It's both about the same distance. Um, and in the midst of that, just in like today, where there's envy and self-seeking and these things going on. Every evil thing is going to be there. There's going to be confusion. And as I was listening, Jack Hibbs has a good little 17 minute or so um, snippet on kind of helping us digest some of this, what's going on in Iran. Um, but don't think it would be on, if every evil thing is there and sensual and it's demonic, don't think that it's above China or North Korea or Russia or Turkey or any of these other players to put a stick in the spot, the pot and stir. Um, because there will be, there, it's just going to be a lot, of, a lot of prayer needed, a lot of trusting God for the outcome and knowing exactly what it is. But also at the same time being encouraged and looking, looking up because our redemption draws near. Before the worship team comes back, does anybody have anything quickly to add? If it's very long, we should probably wait till after, and then we can chat it up all we want. But anything else to throw out there on on Iran or anything that's going on? Was the airliner shut down by Iran or what? They don't know. At first, they said it was mechanical failure, but now they're not ruling out that it could have been a terrorist attack on that airliner, which would involve Ukraine, which wouldn't disappoint Russia. Um. You know, we're all you know we're waiting for that definite hook in the 
the jaw the Lord is going to bring Russia and Turkey down and, and ten nations, and they're, they're going to attack Israel. It's, it's fact. Um, so we are just got our eye on that. Let's go ahead and pray and close out in song, and if you guys want to kick that around some more, we, we certainly can. We live in, man, unique times. Lord, we just thank you so much for this evening. God, we thank you for the example of examining our hearts for selfish ambition. Uh, Lord, because it sure loves to roll around in there and we want things that aren't ours. God, help us to just have that great gain of godliness and contentment and rejoicing in you, Lord, at the health and the life and the stewardship and the blessings and the hope of heaven that we have today, Lord. Let us rejoice in these things because... Lord, the kingdom of God is not eating, drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. God, may they walk in that this week. In Jesus' name, amen.